Okay. Well, good morning and welcome to the first in a series of webinars on the Open Storage Network. We want to thank, of course, the National Science Foundation and the Schmidt, Schmidt Foundation who have made this work possible. Today's webinar is on research drivers and capabilities. For those of you who have not heard of the Open Storage Network, um, what this uh, project has aimed to do, and I think, I think we've done a, a great job at it, is creating a scalable distributed storage infrastructure for research, especially for research that has active data that needs to be shared out. So not the data that's spilling off of um, uh, instruments and not the data that needs to be curated and archived, but the data that uh, other researchers have trouble getting at because it's behind institutional firewalls or they have trouble with because it's not available via high-speed networks. And so we have built something purposefully uh, as low cost as it can be so that it has as much capacity as possible. Uh, and currently you'll see that um, in any uh, goofs and where the pins are is completely my fault. Um, this is just my, my challenge with, uh, with, dealing with, the, with this graphic, but you can see that it's, they're sprinkled throughout the country at several advanced computing centers. And there are actually uh, two more that were funded by the uh, Schmidt Foundation that are at Starlight in Chicago and a second one at Johns Hopkins. And just a, a quick snapshot on the pods, they're a little more than a petabyte of object storage that we uh, run using Ceph. Um, and they are all at least connected at, at 40 gig to um, our educational network in the US, Internet 2. Um, and also uh, traversing over at seed paths as well. Our slowest connection is at 40 gig. As I mentioned, we have a series of webinars planned um, for uh, webinars and then with concept papers coming out in between. So of course today, October 22nd, if you can believe it, we're already almost at the end of October. Um, and then join us again in November. Please put this on your calendar. I'm really excited to uh, introduce some other projects going on around the world and in our nation that are complementary or that inform the work that we've done. And a bit before Thanksgiving, you'll see our first short concept paper um, released with some of the uh, uh, themes that we brought up today. Uh, in January, we're going to give you a retrospective on the Open Storage Network, how you could um, buy your own pod and join in. Um, and make this work for uh, uh, your research. Uh, that will be at the end of January. And shortly thereafter, we'll have the concept paper that, um, that wraps up everything that we did in November um, on that second webinar series. Uh, the last one on data sharing and the role looking forward um, of distributed storage and research will come out and then we will have a concept paper that comes out where we have um, three or four weeks of community comment time. So all that to say is, please follow along. Um, we'll have the recordings available. We'll have some short concept papers for you to digest afterwards. And in the spring, we would like some more input. If you'd like to see um, all of this on the web, so you can send it out as a link, you can see this at openstoragenetwork.org slash seminar hyphen series. Okay, we have uh, four speakers today on three topics. Uh, let's just jump in. Uh, I'd like to introduce Don Petrovic, who's going to talk to us about uh, TerraFusion data for Earth observation. And Don, feel free if you're ready to share, share your slides. Sorry, yes, I'm a little lost in the living in the laptop world in COVID. Yes, no, I knew. Yeah, no, I knew exactly. And it does take a minute too for okay, sure. the I site will, it's going to share. I will attempt to share my slides. And do I, can I do, I have the screen? Yes, yes, please, yeah. Okay, and let me get into slideshow mode. You present, escape. Share this. Share a screen. Show. 
out of the thousand. I hope it's this one. Okay, can you see itinerary? This is the story of a journey of a data set. And um, I didn't do all this work, but I spent a long time supporting it. Um, what is this about? Well, uh, how much time do I have? Don, you have uh, 15 minutes. Okay, so what is this about? This is about a story of the of data derived from the Terra satellite. The Terra satellite is a low Earth orbit satellite that has been circling the Earth for 20 years. It has been building a record, a long, very long baseline record of changes of the Earth and the Earth's climate. And it is particularly suitable for climate science because it has polar orbits. It crosses the equator at the same time on each path each day, taking out, taking out a lot of di diurnal systematics. And it, it's a, a massive data set. What does one do at one day with, with such a data set? Well, can you see my comment? Oh, sorry, Don, you're a bit muffled. Um, well, I've been having laptop trouble. Oh, there we go. You're back. Okay. The, oop, I need to go back. How do I do that in this tool? What does one do with Earth's observations? Well, one can start by looking at specific phenomena in a specific time. And an example of that is uh, this tropical storm that comes from this Terra, Terra satellite. And one, one knows what's one looking for. One knows where to go to get a specific record out of a specific time. But if one is interested as a climate scientist in studying the 20 year detailed record of the Earth's climate over very large areas, right? One isn't looking for a snapshot of a phenomena. One is looking to, to study the whole mission record of the Terra instrument. That record consists of millions of files uh, from four different instruments with difference in packaging and somewhat concept of each of the instruments. Gathering the data for one client, gathering and fusing the data from multiple instruments together from one is proved to be onerous for students that go off and do that. They spend a lot of their time with data mangling, less time on analysis. And so gathering and fusing this data once was seen as enabling mission scale science where one might look at vast tracks of the earth or the earth as a whole over the 20 year record. And the saying from client scientists is 30 years is the climate record this 20 year consistent record that they have is the best they've got that approximates a climate scale record. So to build this FUSE data set, what, so, what, so what did this take and where has this data set gone over its lifetime? So first there's the birth problem of it, the gather problem, right? NASA awarded the Terra Access pro proposal in the mid 2010s. The goal was to build a FUSE data set through 2015 out of this thing. And the requisite input files, well, where were they? They were on a number of NASA DACs. Each NASA DAC has various, various methods for accessing the files down to the protocol level. So the NASA DACs don't live in a world like supercomputing where grid FTP is kind of the lingua franca, right? The size of the ingest was about one, one petabyte and it was, about a, it was over a million files. So phase one was, was uh, more work than the PI anticipated, more duration than the PI anticipated. NCSA ingested this, this stuff was ingested by his project at NCSA and copies were made to tape. Uh, to comment about how this works in the, the data environment, the NASA, the NASA uh, DACs often have you know, elaborate, elaborate security controls, including inline controls. Right, acquisition was enhanced by at least the fact that we didn't have analogous controls at NCSA. We have this kind of open architecture, and it also the but on however the acquisition was by a variety of protocols. Not everything was good FTP, and for example, that means that uh, a direct ingest to a supercomputer that speaks good FTP and otherwise has protections means you have to put protocol translators in the in the way. Right, so how do I get to my next? Right. The, the, you know, then there was actually fusing all this data together. Um, it's some John, apologies, but we're having you're a little uh, muffled again. I don't know if you could um, adjust your audio. Oh, 
Oh, and now you're on mute, but maybe that is intentional while you're fixing something. No, is this better? That's perfect. Yes, thank okay. you. Sorry. Uh, holding my laptop on the lap seems to be the problem. Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> you, are, you are very tall and there's a far distance between your lap and, and your mouth possibly. So. Well, I, I'm told my voice is very loud too. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> this has happened over the last couple of days. This I don't perfect. want to talk much about the production of the fusing because that's a production problem. It occurs on machines. Um, I'll note that uh, uh, dealing with a large number of small files is problematic. And the basic transformation, as far as data handling goes, is to take about a little more than one petabyte, more than a million files, and produce 3.2 petabytes of denormalized data that is easy to stream through into about 80,000 35 gigabyte files formatted as HDF5 as a standard. And why are there 80K? Because there are 80,000 orbits in, this, uh, in, in, in the data set, and that packages the data as the way a scientist wants to think about them orbit by orbit. It took several runs, of course, several scratch builds and tearing down before a good fused format was found. And I'll note that both these things occurred on NSF supported machines. Uh, but the problem of NSF supported machines is while they're free to use, uh, their lifetime is finite. And indeed, the project lasted longer than the lifetime of the Roger, which is an optimized for Earth science computer at NCSA, and Blue Waters, which is a powerful petascale at NCSA. So the production machines are expiring, and now what? Well, we have this data set, and again, the data set needs to go traveling. So what were the new neighborhoods, right? Uh, uh, as I said, that a problem in our ecosystem is that there's no reliable prospect of putting a data set down somewhere and keeping it, right? The original award called for the National Data Service to host it, but that did not materialize as a hosting vehicle for this fusion product. The transfer workflows, well, what, so we had to build transfer workflows. And we were lucky enough that NCSA's director had an interest in large scale earth science and not NSF, NCSA, sorry, that'll get me fired. NCSA provided, I'll correct this slide when I'm done. NCSA provided three petabytes of disk based storage as an interim measure and provided for local science use at Illinois. NASA provided a deep archive uh, based on Glacier, and it's not understood uh, to be used for science use. Uh, we had to build transfer workflows, and we, you know, we were able to achieve uh, 800 megabytes a second DC from NCSA into AWS, which was good, but that's very much an archival copy in our understanding of the data. So uh, with the whole data set kind of locked up either in an institutional scope at NCSA or an archival scope at NASA, what was available for community science use? And well, that depended on the resources we could find. And the two resources that we could find that allowed the community to use some of the data were, did not support the whole 3.2 petabytes of data. So we invented a concept of samplers, which is about 150 terabytes of subsets of paths, namely all time or some specific orbits. There are two such, two, two such distinct samplers exist. One is in an AWS public data set program that was, uh, this deal with AWS was negotiated by NASA and is described by that link. The other one is, in, is provided by the Open Storage Network, which is described, which is present at that link. Uh, and then again, we remain, the two other copies we remain, but they're not really primed for community use. Some interested science at mission scales, mission scale data cannot easily exploit recess, resource three and resource four on the slide. Uh, if you want to know more about it in detail, the data set and its description and, and tools for scientific use are described on Larry D. Jerome's website here. Uh, so what did we, what did we do? Uh, NASA has a main direction of, uh, uh, of, use, of moving, moving uh, computations into the cloud. Uh, we followed up with a, to prototype some ideas that would make the storage of this data set affordable. Um, we know that uh, AWS uh, advertises uh, Deep Glacier as an archive that is also suitable for reprocessing of data sets. Uh, an annual reprocessing of the data set were 3.4 petabytes laid on disk, no one wanted to pay for. And we investigated the idea of direct science use of data in. Glacier. 
Right, so the concern that storage is very inexpensive, I have a table on the next slide, uh, but uh, the concern is data movement costs. This is one of the modes of AWS where you pay for data to move. And if you want a mental picture in your mind, if you imagine that this data is otherwise inaccessible, you, you pay to storage, you, you pay to stage it, you get a day's worth of uh, Amazon S3-like access for free with your stage request. And then if, you're, if your access needs to land longer than that, the clock starts running on the bill. Um, so the approach, and again, you don't want, if for community use, you don't want five people accessing the same data set causing five independent stages. So the approach was to gather data requests in a tour. Uh, this has the benefit that if you're a carousel operator, you're paying for the storage, you're paying for the movement, and you're allowing the data to live for a day in and with access as if Amazon S3. And you count on the application side, the data side to build, to use elastic computing or similar mechanisms to be able to do whatever they want to do in a, in a day while the data are resident for free. This is good that if you're the data set owner, you've achieved the very desirable uh, characteristic of capping your maximum costs. Um, I would say that uh, requests, uh, interviews of scientists at the University of Illinois said, well, as long as the trains run on time and maybe I could get at the data set every two weeks, that, that, that is something that would be interesting compared to not having access to the data set at all. So it's very much analogous to using tape at an HPC center. And depending on how well the tape plant runs, you could say this is like trains that run on time, that at least Amazon can provide a de deterministic schedule for people, even though they have to wait. This is described in a white paper at the URL uh, below. But if you, and so the takeaway analysis of this is, is, is this a low cost home for data in the cloud? And the rough characteristics are the storage, the storage for Larry's stuff was $28,000 a year, not bad. Um, the limitation on the use, the how Amazon supports use cases of, of uh, use of deep, deep storage is that they request that there be no more than N restores per day per petabyte. Uh, this is good uh, because it gives you an idea of when you're operating inside the bounds of what they're wanting to support. For our data set, that was 96 restores per day. On the other hand, this has the problem that the application has to confront is that it has to pack, one has to say, how long can a tour take? How, uh, and the, you know, the, the baseline from the scientist was, was uh, two weeks. The, if you work, take our data set and divide by the number of restores, the minimum time supported by AWS use cases is five days. And it would suggest that we have to repack the 32 gigabyte files and something like into 480 bigger blobs at five terabytes each, or, and then relaxing that somewhat to figure out what access patterns the scientists would want, and, but still staying within the two week guidance that was given to us by our scientists. The movement cost for one of these tours is $13,000, and the duration of useful access one stage is not 14 hours, it's 24 hours, that's a typo. So if one looks at the cost there for that experiment, one comes up with characteristics like this. I'm sorry, ah, here, the annual operating cost is in the, is in the slide next to this. Where did it go? I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, I think you're back at the beginning, no problem. Yeah. So to, to look at hosting this particular data set, if you dumped it in S3 at list price when we wrote this document, that was $604,000. Uh, if you put the data in a data carousel and took the storage and movement costs, remembering that you're putting people in a batch environment where the data appear on my schedule, not their schedule, the cost is $185,000 for 26 tours. That's a, that's a chance to grab your data every two weeks. And a, and a nice operational advantage of this thing is that if it turns out you think the world's gonna love this data and pound on it, but no one shows up, you're reduced to whole, uh, just the $28,000 a year storage cost. If you would apply this to multiple, multiple data sets, 
um, you'd be maintaining one carousel infrastructure that could be leveraged over multiple data sets. And you would not especially have to pay attention to managing data in a tier, uh, pushing unused data sets down in the tier or not, the cost sort of auto, auto reduced to complete latency and dead archive automatically because the carousel doesn't fetch something if something's not requested. So what did we learn, right? Finding homes for large data sets, which enables science that is at the scale of mission scale science is very problematic, right? There was an attempt to get NC NSF to form a national data service that didn't work. There was an attempt to put this, to find a way to put this all out in the cloud according to some agency roadmaps that, uh, uh, that still seems problematic and too expensive. The basic uh, uh, fusion project had challenges in gather operations and had to find a way and is trying to find a way to find to, to, to get uh, community exploitation of its full data product. The open science network is important in hosting a sampler, right? And then trying to go back to the mainstream direction advocated by the agencies, the lowest cost cloud resident hosting methods we could find provided access patterns requiring batch techniques. If you think the alternative is a tape resident data set on an HBC center, you're on pretty much equal ground. If you want all your data to be cloud native and, and cannot integrate batch and delay in your software, then you're gonna be unhappy. Uh, but on top of that, we were unable to find a funding mechanism to sustain the data in this low cost mode. And again, hosting the data in the cloud is coupled with scientists' concerns for funding their computations and storage under commercial terms and conditions. And that's what I have. Thank you so much, Don. And let me also draw attendees uh, attention to the Q&A tool. Um, should be at the bottom of your screen there. Please feel free um, to, to pop a question in there um, now or at the end. So we should have a, a few minutes. OK, well, let me um, invite the next person to speak. Let me just uh, share. Share the intro real quick. So um, uh, Wolfgang Gerlach is here to talk to us about SAGE. Um, and let me turn the screen sharing over to you, Wolfgang. Thank you. It should be this one. <clears throat> Do you see my slide? Perfect. OK, so uh, <clears throat> you need to apologize if this is a little bit chaotic because I have not given this uh, talk before and most of the slides are not mine. So, <laughs> um, so I, I work at the uh, um, at Argo National Laboratory. Um, I work for the uh, SAGE project. Uh, Pete Beckman is my supervisor. Um, I'm mostly responsible for the uh, um, in software infrastructure. And wait a second, sorry. Uh, why did it automatically? Does it automatically? Oh, how do I go back? Sorry. No problem. We're all friends here. So we know uh, how this goes. How do I go back to slide? Oh, that's, I would okay. use your arrow keys on your keyboard. Yes, yes, yes. OK. You, you can't trust technology. Yeah. yeah. That also. Um, yeah, and it's also, I think, the first time I use PowerPoint in a long, long time. So. Um, so the background here is uh, um, that many sensors out in the field uh, produce lots of data. And if you want to uh, transfer the data, it's not, not that easy because uh, some of these sensors, for example, hyperspectral imaging produces uh, data up to a terabyte per day. Uh, and if you have these one sensors to be out in the field uh, and do you do not want to carry around USB sticks or something similar like that, uh, you need a mobile connection, and uh, with this um, that, uh, that amount of data, it's in, in the long term not very feasible. Uh, so, um, what you want to do is you want to do compute at the edge. So you what you want to like uh, analyze the data at the edge, extract information, and uh, um, only uh, transfer the small amounts of data. So, um, one of these challenges is that you have all these many different kinds of sensors, uh, LiDAR, software-defined radios, uh, the hyperspectral imaging, uh, no normal cameras. And you even have these uh, facilities that uh, contain many, many sensors at once. Uh, and, and the idea is that you uh, not only like 
do the compute at the edge, but also you collect training data uh, and your subsets of, of, the, of the data that's being produced, uh, uploaded it to uh, uh, co compute centers, uh, do some, some deep learning training to create uh, models that can then be used to uh, extract the uh, information from the raw data. Um, but the idea isn't only that you uh, uh, extract the information from the nodes, but here the idea is also that you use this information you collected from the models and from the, the data that you collected also to send data to the to the edge, for example, to, to control uh, uh, um, um, a pen to, uh, pen to zoom cameras, for example. So for example, there's a wildfire and you want to, want to zoom into a certain location to better get a better view of the, the fire. Um, so the reason to, to do the compute live on the edge, uh, there are multiple reasons. One, of course, is that you produce more data than you have bandwidth. Um, often the latency, latency is important if you have to do quick local decisions. Um, sometimes, for example, if you want to count people, you don't want to like uh, trans, uh, transmit uh, images of people. You just want to count the number of people, for example, crossing a street. Um, also, there's a certain amount of uh, en energy efficiency, which uh, makes you uh, want to do the compute uh, on the edge. Um, one step back uh, into the history of our group. Um, so the, the first big project uh, was the Area of Things in Chicago. Uh, the Area of Things uh, was a NSF funded major research instrumentation project in partnership with the city of, Uni city of Chicago. City of Chicago, led by the University of Chicago and Argon National Laboratory. The underlying hardware and software used is Argon's open Waggle platform. Um, so that's also part of my background. I used to be part of that group at that time. Uh, so we um, uh, created this hardware, which contains uh, um, uh, small computers and sensors to mostly con co collect simple sensor information like uh, temperature, humidity, and these kinds and, and several kinds of air quality. Uh, sensors, uh, the air quality um, uh, information. Um, at this time, we already had uh, cameras uh, uh, included, uh, one camera for the, for the top uh, and one camera at the bottom of the, of the device. Um, you see the, uh, the, comp the, the uh, computers and the cameras were located in the blue box and the uh, other sensors for air and everything and all the other stuff was located in the Stevenson Shield. Uh, we did do, use this to do some uh, research on the um, uh, cameras, but this was not our main focus. Uh, mostly this was about collecting simple sensor information. So the idea is now to, to move uh, to better devices, more modern devices. Uh, if you are familiar with the Raspberry Pi, this was the kind of device that we uh, used before. It's very similar to a Raspberry, uh, Raspberry Pi, a, a pocket-sized device. But now we're moving to slightly larger devices with um, stronger GPUs that have allow us to more sophisticated uh, applications. Um, so the idea is to collect the, the, the raw data at the edge to uh, use a neural network or something like this uh, to extract information, to get information about, for example, here, plant species, uh, count pedestrians, uh, detect drones, uh, traffic flow, uh, collect information about wildlife and things like that. Um, and then also the idea is that you collect this information then to trigger, you trigger uh, and change parameters at the edge. So for this reason, to, to, to extend this, uh, Sage was uh, developed. It's supposed to be a cyber infrastructure for AI, AI at the edge. This uh, project started uh, about a year ago. Uh, there are several partners involved that uh, ha already have sensors out in the field, uh, especially NEON. They have lots of uh, environmental uh, ecolog ecological sensors out in the field. Uh, and HP Ren that have uh, uh, lots of cameras and many of those are used for uh, wildfire detection. Um, here's the uh, three bigger examples. The one was the, uh, was the uh, AOT example that we already started in the past with the regular project. Um, it is on the neighborhood scale. Then the HP Ren is more on the regional scale. It is for the wildfire detection. Um, and then we have the neon, which is on the continental scale. Um, to pick just one example in, in neon, uh, the idea is that we uh, connect not only uh, 
computation at the edge, but also connect it with uh, capability, capabilities and uh, um, high performance computing. Um, so the, the NEON uh, project is a multi-decade project to understand changing ecosystems. They have 81 files, uh, field sites, uh, 100,000 data samples each year. Uh, and uh, Sage will deploy AI at the edge to link with uh, high performance compute centers and detect interesting uh, uh, phenomena uh, and uh, notify signs at real time. So you can imagine, for example, to monitor like bats or migrating animals and, and movements of clouds and things like that. Um, while we in the past had only like these, these small devices with a Stevenson shield, uh, uh, we are going to reuse those devices, but uh, put in some change internally a little bit and put in bigger uh, compute nodes um, that they are more comparable with uh, like a small, uh, a small um, laptop in the and, and with a strong GPU card. And uh, in addition to that, it's possible to us that we also uh, use um, uh, server grade uh, uh, machines uh, in locations where we have a uh, 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 um, uh, small hut, for example, where we, where we can have where we do have the power and uh, to run these. So the um, the goal for Sage is to serve basically four different kinds of users. Uh, there are the uh, scientists that develop on the on the right side here. There are the uh, scientists that develop AI algorithms. They are probably interested in the Sage training data that we collected. Um, there are those that want to actually like deploy, um, um, that want to develop the, uh, what would be part of, of the uh, cyber infrastructure and want to help develop the uh, code. Uh, they want to test the code uh, on our infrastructure. Um, and then there are those that want to run the experiments at the edge, and they want to like be able to, to send uh, uh, configuration to the edge nodes. Um, and there are also those that are not interested in, in running the in, in uh, running software on our infrastructure, but they just want to like get the uh, information or the sensor data that's been collected, and they want to like analyze the data and um, yeah. So the uh, architecture that we uh, plan and and partially already have is uh, in the center we have the beehive server this is a server that collects the uh, sensor information from the nodes out in the field um, then the uh, data collected on beehive is being moved to the sage data repository uh, the sage uh, data repository consists of three pieces uh, the the object store uh, a simple sensor api and a live stream So currently, or if for the, the, especially for the AOT nodes that you have seen in the pictures before, uh, we are uh, at the moment only hosting uh, CSV files in, 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 on, on our website. It's not very sophisticated, but does the job. Um, but in, for the future, we are hoping to um, stick the data, sensor data all in a database and provide an API on top that allows uh, users to make more sophisticated search queries. Uh, we are also investigating CCAN, the data portal, for a more intuitive uh, um, browsing in the data. The other thing that we will need is a, a live stream of the sensor data. As I said, right now we have only like something like daily dumps. Um, and then what's new, because we need to collect all these large files, uh, the training data from the edge, uh, we are going to need an object store for the large files. And this is where the open storage network uh, is very helpful. So the object store is going to collect, uh, is there to like mm, hold the training data from Sage nodes, but also possibly from users that, uh, that collected uh, have training data from somewhere else. Uh, it's images, videos, sound files, LiDAR data, multispectral images, so different kinds of sensor data. Um, they do not tip our previous model of small sensor data where we had temperature values and things like that. Um, also, we think uh, to use the object store for other things. So for example, if a, a Sage user develops a machine learning model, he probably does not stick it into GitHub, but he can use our object store for that. And then he can share it with other users. And it can also be used to, uh, when we deploy an, uh, an, an application on the edge, that we can extract the, uh, get the um, model from, from that object store. 
Um, so the idea is that we have these nodes collecting information, that the information goes to the, our Beehive server, and then this the training data goes to this object store, which is basically it, uh, it's going to be an, uh, or is, it is an API server that just forwards with the right credentials to the OSN uh, S3 backend. Um, our understanding is this is, uh, on the backend is a, a Ceph, that's a Ceph object storage. Um, and uh, so that the users are also able to upload uh, via their, uh, via our API server, upload data into the object store and, and also get the data, gets the training data from that object store. So the object store uh, isn't just a simple uh, an API server. It is, um, supports a um, um, S3 style, uh, sorry, it, it requires an S3 style uh, storage backend. It itself has a RESTful API, which is very similar to the S3 a path style as addressing model. And the idea is it is very similar to S3 itself, but it has some minor but important differences here. So the idea is that we have the concept of virtual buckets. Um, whenever you create a bucket, you get a UUID, a UUID as, an, as an identifier to prevent namespace conflicts. And the idea is that you have always only one file per bucket or a data set, which means it is a, a, a set of files that share the same metadata. So you could, for example, have like the camera images from one day all sharing the same metadata, with the exception, of course, of the date, but all the other metadata is the same. So it means uh, um, metadata is uh, kept at the level of buckets, and uh, buckets uh, also are the level where we maintain like ownership information and the permission control. Um, the object store can be accessed via the JSON REST API, but also by a Python client library and a command line client. In the future, of course, we want to be it accessible also by the Sage website, but we are not there yet. Um, the users would then uh, authorize uh, via uh, uh, OAuth2 access tokens. They will get them by logging into our website. Uh, if we use for that one, we use uh, Globus. And once they are logged in, they, then they can click a button, create token, and they get a token that's valid for like three months. Um, and once they do that, they can create uh, buckets and upload them. Then, then they can make, keep them private for a certain amount of time, or they can share them with colleagues or make them simply public. Um, the implementation is uh, an open source implementation and, and written in Golang. Um, here's a link to the Git repository. And for those that are interested, um, if you go to the Git repo, there's a documentation where you can um, use a, a startup, a Dockerized environment on your laptop as one single command. Docker compose up, it will start the API server, MySQL database, and also an S3 implementation called MinIO. Uh, so you can also follow then our documentation, like a tutorial to like create a bucket on your laptop and upload data just for testing purposes. Uh, the, Idea being, this is very general purpose. So I could imagine that other other scientists, uh, other projects might be interested in, in using something like that. Um, yeah, I think that's was all. Are there any questions? Yes, feel free to put your questions in the uh, Q and A tool be below. Uh, thank you so much, Wolfgang. I really really enjoyed that. I'm really glad to be working with you on this project. I've so many questions. I want to know why you're worried about bats uh, uh, converging on your, your sensors, but I know that's not the topic of the webinar, so, so I'll ask you that offline. Um, now I'd like to uh, turn to our last talk, if I can. Let's see if I can. Here we go. And uh, welcome Chris Leonard and Christina uh, Bandera Goda from University of Washington and Renzi, respectively who are going to talk to us about a project that um, has to do with integrated hurricane data collections uh, for multiple applications. And Chris, if you'd like to um, uh, share your screen, you should have access now. Perfect. I, I love Zoom because you, you do something like share and then the control panel jumps somewhere and you have to find it and do the standard unmute kind of thing. But anyway, thank you very much for uh, inviting us to, to give this talk. Um, we're going to be doing kind of the tag team thing between myself and Christina. Um, it's going to be kind of interesting because um, due to COVID and a few other things, we've, we've been uh, kind of going back and forth and 
Uh, this is the first time we're doing the synthesized version of this. Um, and in this kind of a context, I tend to be kind of pretty literal. So if you look at our title, um, my half of the title is what the facilitating access to integrated hurricane data collections. And then Christina is able to take that and make it into something uh, much more comprehensive and detailed, which is the, the sort of subtitle, if you want to call it that, but uh, really adding the context to this uh, talk. And, and that's how basically the talk is going to be framed in that um, I will go over some of the sort of contextual things, a little bit about the data, where we got to where we are, um, some of the higher level uh, things that kind of questions that we could be using the data for, talk a little bit about the challenges, and then turn it over to Christina to kind of really take a deeper dive. And then we'll wrap up with just where we think we'd like to head with all this. Um, before I go any further, I did want to let Christina have a chance to say any introductory words if she had any at this point. Oh, I just wanted to say I'm here and thanks for um, the opportunity to share work with you. And uh, Chris, did you agree that it's a good idea to experiment on everyone with an, ex an immersive experience? I, I didn't put that forward yet. So okay. well, <laughs> if, if you want to talk about that, go right ahead. So, uh, depending on how much time we have, we, we are somewhat prepared improvisationally speaking to experiment with um, our, our design for an educational experience that would give you an idea of what does it feel like. For example, we, we've been working on rapid projects to archive data. I go to um, Puerto Rico, I make new amazing colleagues who I owe my life to in, in, in such deep respect. And I go to meet their like trusted, sensitive, you know, owners of their, their lifelong professional relationships. And I march in and they, and I tell them about our rapid research and they just got electricity last week, six months after Hurricane Maria, you know, like it's such a, it's such a, you can't recreate that immersive experience on Zoom, but I'm, I tried and I can subject you to that after um, Chris does, gives his, uh, literal and very useful, beautiful slides you made. Sounds good and feel free you can take till the end of the, the top of the hour if you'd like. So we'd love to see it. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, we, we um, take every opportunity we can uh, to, to learn. So that's part of what's going on here. So excellent. So just to reiterate, uh, the context is hurricanes. It's I think it's been real interesting to see these or hear these listen to these talks this morning because of the sort of, um, not overlap, but congr congruity in, in terms of topics being earth and environmental and satellite data and things like that. And um, I just love these uh, GOES satellite images that NOAA puts out. And of course, this is the, the Hurricane Epsilon, which is churning away right, right now. And these images are not quite real time or near real time, but they're, they're very, very fresh. Um, but our data, uh, that we've been focusing on is a uh, different kind of NOAA data, which is data set data product called the National Water Model data or National Water Model. So these are uh, outputs derived from combining different kinds of inputs. Um, I don't know all the technical details, but there's plenty of information about that. And the goal for the National Water Model data is to produce this kind of uniform, uniform surface related to, to water flow data flow or water flows in order to predict things like um, flooding. And before this was developed, there was not, uh, it's my understanding, there was not a uniform uh, data set. And the initial effort um, was at a coarser resolution and, and I believe they're, they're now on uh, version two, which, which they've been improving the, um, the resolution as they go. The, the data is available um, through NOAA sites um, and through, uh, and the format is net CDF. Um, as you might Im imagine, there are many, 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 many thousands, if not millions of granules, just like kind of a remote sensing satellite data. Um, and there's different um, outputs, different sort of variables as well. 
So the data not only are large, they're complicated, and they're being continually produced. Um, part of the backstory here is that we got into this use case because um, I believe it was Hurricane Matthew a few years ago. Um, we work with Kawazi and have helped uh, Kawazi build and we help maintain the HydroShare uh, resource, if any of you are familiar with that, which is this um, data and model and resource sharing uh, online tool that hydrologists and others use. But in the context of that project, a few years ago, Hurricane Matthew rolled through uh, North Carolina and elsewhere. And, and I came to understand that Renzi was maintaining a rolling, something like 14 day window of these data on our servers. Um, and that at the, at the NOAA side of things, once the data were created uh, and I guess an archive that, that the products were falling onto the, to, to the floor. And I, and I got to thinking and saying, well, you know, wouldn't it be useful for researchers to have sort of an integrated, you know, from a couple of weeks before a hurricane, then during the hurricane and a couple of weeks after the hurricane to have an integrated chunk of data that they could then integrate with other data and do different kinds of analyses. So we, we grabbed that initial chunk of data and we've, we, done that for similar, uh, similarly for additional hurricanes since then, those collections are, are um, documented or, or cataloged in HydroShare as resources. And there are ways to get to those data through HydroShare. But our hope is to be using uh, the, the OSN node in a more sort of um, uh, uh, re functional way in the sense of not just go access data and pull it down, but be able to, to do other kinds of analyses and, and uh, things like that run tools. So this is a, a work in progress from that standpoint. So here's the data that we have available. So here's the different hurricanes that um, we have those collections for. We've managed to move uh, two collections over uh, to the node right now. And um, what we've been really trying to really drive towards is getting people to use the data and how do we get people access and what's, what counts as a, as a really, um, as a good use case. Um, because my initial thought was, well, let's just put these data out there. If we can use some tools or put some tools on top to facilitate access and point some folks to it that will we'll build the, um, the usage that way because I didn't go into it with a very, very specific use case. And that's where this partnership working with Christina on these rapid projects and things like that has been very, very helpful because that's uh, allowing us to, to really delve into some good use cases where we can uh, leverage the capabilities of the, the node. Oh, yes, so can I, um, can I just interject one? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm just certain onboarding prompt for everyone. If you go back to the uh, table that you had, we have, um, so as a, in preparation for you to make a choice about uh, the immersive experience and what you think about it, as an example of an invisible problem that you're not conscious of, uh, if any, does anyone see the invisible thing that is missing from this slide? <laughs> what is invisible there's no yeah, reason so it's missing <laughs> there's no reason you should know i don't expect you should know what's there there's no reason it should be there you should feel no shame of not seeing it's there but it, it, there is something invisible there so does anyone see it right do it's you want people to put that in chat and then pick up on yeah, it at the end if you think you know or you think you don't know even how you feel about knowing or not knowing or how annoying it is that i'm asking this and interrupting chris all like all feedback we're interested to know how you feel about this invisible thing that's not on this slide <laughs> that we'll talk about later. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Okay, thank, thank you. So um, what kinds of questions could we think about, um, you know, if you're doing your water uh, quality researcher, can we drink the water after a hurricane is particularly relevant in the Puerto Rico Maria context. Um, Renzi's involved in another uh, North Carolina project to do a baseline uh, measurement of these per, per fluoral and per polyfluoral alkali, alkali, sorry, substances, which is the no, non-stick 
uh, coatings and the fire suppression that are showing up, chemicals that are showing up in water. And they've noticed some dynamics related to the hydrology that concentrations go up during droughts and go down during uh, wet times. So that would be something to research. Um, we have spread of pathogens um, after a hurricane rolls through and the waste lagoons from the industrial agricultural production overflow that creates problems. We even have, uh, as you probably know, people, researchers looking at ways to track uh, the prevalence of, of COVID. Um, and then sort of more in a different vein, what kinds of capabilities do we need to have that have to persist um, to make, make these uh, resources viable? And this is partly what Christine is going to be talking about. Um, challenges, you know, the same, same kinds of things that we've heard about. It's lots of data. How do we understand it? How do we understand its limitations? If we're going to use the data uh, with, to integrate with, with other uh, data to answer some of these questions, which the questions require lots of heterogeneous data, um, how are we going to be able to do that? Some of the data we want to get as is ephemeral. Where do we find the tools? What tools do we need? And so on. And then on the other side is just sort of these other kinds of sociological problems, the awareness, how do you build awareness, capacity building in terms of the communities that are gonna use it? How do you build the communities to come together to use the resource? How to use it as an educational resource? And this ties in with my research interests, which is the socio-technical putting these together. Um, so if you talk about infrastructure, just having a node sitting out there, a storage node, and, and that it's labeled infrastructure doesn't really make it infrastructure until it gets incorporated into a sort of systematic usage. All right, let me stop talking and turn it over to Christina to kind of give you some more perspective. Um, thanks, Chris. I'm so grateful to work with you because I feel like it's so simple how you've put it forward like that. I feel it's like calming to me, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying it's simplistic, but anyway, no, that's okay. No, it's very, it's very <laughs> like, it's, I feel like the, it makes sense that the world is an ordered place. I can make sense of it um, from those slides. Thank you. How much time, what did I do a time check? About six minutes by my watch. Yeah, okay. sounds right. Okay, I think we have enough time for that. So, um, so when the piece of the, the hard thing for me to explain to you and provide an experience for you um, and also just acknowledge that some of you may have already have had this experience um, also and I can't see you and I don't know if you've had this experience of you know something like being a helicopter science and a scientist and trying to help and putting your whole heart into loving the work you do and then feeling invisible and but knowing that you know and you're an expert and you know that how to use this information and how to curate it to solve this problem that means so much to you like that's my assumption is that's why you're all here my experience with open super open super technical people is that you do not do this work for the money or the fame or the acknowledgement because no one understands what you do and so I just want to acknowledge that that's the case and that um, when I had that experience with Hurricane Maria, um, I, in parallel, I was learning a lot from people who are really good at data science and education. And we, um, we're, trying, we're trying to, you know, cyber training came out as a new NSF program so we could teach experts and research software users um, how to use this amazing research software that people like you are building. So cyber being an educator in a cyber training NSF program are experimenting on how to educate people who are already experts and don't even know they wanna learn this thing and actively are resisting learning this thing because they're too busy to learn Python, God damn it, <laughs> right? These are, the, these are my students and I have like deep affection for the, the incredible stress and strain and load of, of the complexities of teaching and researching and, and educating with your whole heart. And as it turns out, we call it a wicked problem, which you're all familiar with. And Chris and I have like found ourselves like un, unlikely synchronous 
buddies in this hurricane of a wicked problem where we've circled around trying to do a rapid workshop for more than a year. And it's a, you know, as an example, case study, $200,000 is a NSF rapid project maximum. It's split, we've split it between a ridiculous amount of partners who we know are all the people who know all of these unique bits of infrastructure that are missing in order for um, people to, for someone like our colleague Graciela to work with the communities that she works with to teach, she trains her operators to, you know, with partners from the EPA, how to collect the data samples um, from their own systems so that they can uh, protect their communities and their homes and their households. So it's household scale, IRB, HIPAA protected, um, health data which is in the middle of a before or after you know prepare what we proposed is that we could there was some infrastructure that could exist that could operate so that people could be more prepared so that something like hurricane maria which was you know a historical disaster that it's possible we could prepare better than we did we were before her maria happened you know, have we learned from 2017 data and all of the data that's on the archives that um, Chris had on that table that I asked you about? Um, we, it's a, it's a, it's a wicked problem because it's not the, the bits that are missing of pulling it together. It's it's so chaotic. We can't even teach people that oh how all the things they need to know to be aware of how to to do informed consent to learn how to access that data that's on the OSN node because they're um, traumatized either by disaster or by their line of work is, is just so stressful, which in some cases, some, some people on the call may be experiencing right now because it's a global pandemic or because or you felt like this before it, it was even a global pandemic. So the fact is we started out our project with like 500 bits of infrastructure all synced together into an online platform. And the current plan is we're only going to do one platform at a time and slowly build it up. So the immersive experience that we're going to present to you here is just a piece of text that you can read. And um, it's, I'm just going to put it into the Zoom chat box in an effort to be as simple as possible um, in a way that's accessible. And let's see. And that chat is coming soon. And if anyone needs to go, please feel free to go. If you don't want to participate in this immersive experience, that's fine. Um, and I'm trying to do it I'm mean, actually right now part of the experiment has already started where I'm struggling with my entire career I was just trying to figure out how to copy and paste things and I'm intentionally trying to do this from my phone from a text you know just putting through copying just to one platform it's a cell phone with a zoom chat that's the only interaction that should be happening. And I've just wasted like 60 seconds of your time. So the chat there, the, the first part of it copied over, but glitch, of course it doesn't translate. I'll stop talking about that and put the rest of it in there. So Chris, can you tell me, could you time like 60 seconds or so? Yes, yes, sorry, getting to mute button. So you want, you're giving people time to read it, is that the deal? That's a deal, except um, this is so typical of, this is a, such a, a totally immersive experience of what it's like to work with Chris and I, because the, the size of the text in my chat does not fit the size of the text in Zoom. So there's a limit, I didn't know about it. And now I'm trying to figure out how to, 
copy and paste the rest of the story over in the most ridiculous, ex ridiculously vulnerable experiment. <laughs> for so someone. you have 15, 15 seconds. <laughs> so, and, and Christina, we're, we're over time. So in, okay. out of respect for folks, I guess we should try to kind of yep. close this up. Well, and, and thank you for giving us a totally unique way to close <laughs> the age of um, lots and lots of uh, webinars and Zooms. That one's a first. And so we thank you for helping us to be on the edge of, of everything that's new, including with that. And, and I loved uh, uh, Heidi's comment about uh, the, the cat as part of the immersive experience. You can't have a pandemic webinar without a cat. Um, and so thank you so much uh, for your presentation. And, and I'd like to thank all of the speakers um, for giving us a lot to think about. I think if we could wrap up um, the theme of today's webinar into just one closing thought that everyone uh, presented in their own way, it's that there are some things um, in research that just can't happen without distributed storage, without petascale storage. Um, otherwise, you find that you change your research project and cut out things that you would otherwise like to offer to the people that could make use of your data. And so thank you again so much to everyone. Uh, we will have um, a recording of this posted and look for our next webinar uh, coming up in November, as well as uh, our concept paper. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. And I, and I put the chat, if you, in the chat, there's a opportunity to give us feedback on our experiment. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. thanks for hosting us.